Today, I am speaking with Peter Bogosian. Peter is a philosopher and a assistant professor at Portland State University, but he is probably most well known for the Grievance Studies Affair, also called so-called Square. He, James Lindsay, and Helen Primrose, two other academics, basically wrote and tried to have published a couple dozens of bogus social justice papers. I mean, it's really hilarious. If you haven't looked into it already, you definitely look into the Grievance Studies Affair. It, I mean, it's fantastic. I'm actually going to put a link for a playlist where you can watch this whole thing. Uh, Peter and I refer to that in our conversation. But he is truly a rational thinker, and he recently wrote and published a book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. So the first half of our talk here today pretty much has to do with the most counterintuitive pieces of advice from this book and it's really interesting if you're into street epistemology or if you ever just wonder how on earth can we keep communicating with each other in this climate of political polarization and tribalism and all the, the other stuff that's going on right now this is just a fascinating conversation without further ado i am proud to bring you peter bogosian as soon as I ask you to please subscribe to this podcast, it doesn't cost you a damn thing, but it has value to me. Peter Bogosian, welcome on the show. My absolute pleasure to be here. No, the, I insist the pleasure is mine. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about your book. First of all, when can people use this book? I mean, what, what is a, an impossible conversation? Well, it's a conversation across a gulf or a divide or a political divide or moral divide or when you're stuck in the house on quarantine and my daughter sent me a meme in which I'm walking around the neighborhood. So if I'm a little out of breath, that's why uh, right. that's my goal, actually, uh, of, of somebody blinking and uh, a guy blinking and his girlfriend said, if he blinks one more time, I'm going to kill him. So when you're on each other's nerves, when you... It's a way to empower yourself to have better conversations. And a good piece of news that I just found out today is the book has been accepted to be uh, uh, or solicited to, tra to be translated to Korean. I think it's, it's, it's its sixth or seventh language so far. So that's pretty good. Wow, that's awesome. Awesome. Right. Okay, so let's get into to the, the nitty gritty stuff from your book. So the book essentially lists these 36 techniques. And uh, according to their difficulty of application, as you describe yes. it in, in the book, there's a co-author for the book. We should probably mention that, right? Yes, James Lindsay is the co-author. Very, very fortunate to have him. We spoke to Jim today about a wide range of stuff, grievance studies, and Jim is full-time combating the new religion of social justice and intersectionality. So real quick, so if anybody's interested in what Jim's up to, New Discourses is his... New, just I think it's newdiscourses.com or org, and I'm still plugging away at doing what I'm doing, and yeah. So go ahead. Right, right, right. We're gonna uh, place a link for that, obviously, in the show notes. But uh, let's. I mean, obviously, we can't go uh, over the whole book uh, right here and now. But I want to get into some of the most counterintuitive things. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, for people following this, uh, listening to this podcast, that I knew, you know, I I spoke with um, Jonas Kaplan, and we went over the backfire effect. But one of the oh, yeah, most yeah. one one of the most crucial things, uh, early part of the book is this thing about avoiding facts. I mean, it strikes me. I knew me you were going to say that. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. That is the most counterintuitive thing imaginable. You're correct. Right. So, what, what, why is that? Why is that so important? Yeah, I'm glad you spoke to Jonas. He's a good guy. I spoke to him a couple of years ago. Right. Uh, avoiding facts is crucial because if people believed on the basis of facts everybody more or less everybody would believe the same thing so we know that people do not formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence and and we know that because there's no convergence on empirical phenomena so right. there's a convergence so the more the empirical phenomenon leaks into the moral realm or the more it has identity level salience the less likely it is that people will formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence or facts, as we say in the book. And so when you do bring up evidence, it has the exact opposite impression of the impression you would think 
it causes people to hunker down and actually be less willing to, if you want to use a technical term, revise their beliefs or change their minds. So facts does the exact opposite of what people think it, it does. Right, right. You, was there ever a time where that was not the case in your opinion? No. <laughs> no, I'm, no, that's just, that's a, that's a feature of uh, the architecture of belief structures. Right, right, right. So, so mean, you, you could, you could jerry rig that, you know, you, I, I feel we're, since we started a little late, we're both kind of rushing this. Uh, you, you could, you could, uh, you know, like marionettes, you could jerry rig that by having a culture. If you truly created a culture that was that valued belief revision and changing your mind, then maybe that would be the case. But I think that it's too difficult. It's all, it's impossible given the current state of affairs. Right. Right. I mean, I do find that when I I'm with close friends or just an academic debate with, with other scholars, right. I mean, that that's like where an arena where it's allowed, it's even expected. Right. Yeah, I think so. You know, just maybe this is, a little extra topical, but I'm thinking about a lot of people, for example, in my discipline mm. of philosophy who don't have scientific training, training the scientific method. I mean, not even control groups, receivables and stuff like that, but they, they will offer a speculation, specifically a, a speculation about metaphysics, you know, what there is, uh, and they'll form those questions and they'll expect people to reason to certain truths about the universe. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, in fact, I'm fairly confident it's not true. Like, for, for example, if I said, what is the, you know, Heisenberg's ordering of reality, the ordering of reality, or what, what is the, the um, I don't know, something that benefits, you know, the, the fundamental structure of the universe. Well, I don't know, maybe there is no st fundamental structure of the universe. You can't reason to it. And mm. so often we have two things operative. One is people don't think that they need evidence to formulate their beliefs because they can intuit or reason to things. But the deeper problem is when you ask, you're in a conversation and you're asking questions or just engaging somebody in a sub on, a, on a substantive topic, in a substantive way on a topic of significance to them and you offer facts, they'll go the other way and, and become more recalcitrant in what they believe. Right. Right. So two, uh, two issues. Right. Listening to you saying that actually makes me think that perhaps even in a debate uh, among I mean, physicists or mathematics or whatever, I mean, this effect might still be, uh, be something to consider because those are humans too. Right. Yeah, it may be. I mean, think about it like this. As far as I know, I was just talking to my, my friend Lawrence Cross about this. As far as I know, there is not a single iota of evidence for anything in string theory. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about it. I think it was the, the famous physicist Brian Greene said, it might be a waste of some really good math. I, I, I don't know, but I don't think that that's an empirical, that's based upon, it may be at some principle testable. I'm not a theoretical physicist, ask Krauss or and the other right. theoretical physicists. But the, the idea is that evidence, so, so ultimately you'd have evidence and reason combined. You wouldn't just, you know, it's the empiricism, rationalism idea. But when in conversations, I mean, I, we've been talking some pretty high level shit, but in conversations about ordinary pedestrian matters, you don't want to invoke facts. You just want to ask people targeted questions to see if their ideas make sense to them. Right. And more often than not, you'll be shocked to know that they don't even think what they they believe makes any sense. Right, right, right. I mean, okay, so this this is a natural segue into the the next little uh, thing I have on my screen here, like the importance of listening and understanding and reflecting back. Right, that's like the basis for any type of conversation. Right. That's absolutely correct. And so, if you don't understand what somebody says. There's no intervention. There's no, it's not really a conversation. It's a message delivery service. You're delivering your message. They're delivering their message. Mm. Wow, I'm watch, watching a guy walk down the street in an Easter bunny suit. Uh, you're delivering your <laughs> message. They're delivering their message. And that's not a conversation. Right. So you, you, you have to, to really substantively engage someone. 
you have to figure out the section of the book epistemology, how they know what they know. And you can't just guess at that. That's not something that say, well, they know because no, you have to ask them how they know it. Right. And then you have to ask them some more advanced, but just confirmation criteria under what conditions that belief be false. Like, but you have to repeat that back to them so that they acknowledge that you, that's his rap reports rules. I think it's chapter five. They acknowledge that you understand what they're talking about and why they believe it. Right. Right. You, I believe you used to, uh, you used to talk to, uh, prison inmates. Is that correct? Yeah, that was, I did my dissertation in prisons to improve the cognitive, th the critical thinking and moral reasoning of prison inmates. Right. I mean, I mean, I used to work in uh, social services, not exactly a prison setting, but, but certainly, uh, partially the same demographic, uh, take my word on for, for that. But, but I remember I read about uh, reports uh, rule about reflecting right. back what people told me really just listening to what they say and then say it again, repeat it back in my words, not in their words, but in, in right. my words. And it really actually had a significant impact on the conversations I was able to have just that simple little hack. I was just wondering if you had similar experiences from, from that. absolutely un unquestionably. And that's why in how to have impossible conversations, we say repeatedly, please, please, please do not jump ahead. Every chapter builds upon every other chapter. And that's just one teeny teeny technique from chapter five the more you bundle these in suites of techniques and the more you use these in baskets the more effective you will be at whatever your conversational goal is right 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 okay let, let's talk about this confirmation that's probably what strikes me as the most complicated uh thing to yes. master from 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 your book so, so first of all what is it 10 second break to thank our channel sponsor crypto.com provider of these metal debit visa cards that you can load with cryptocurrency or regular money get two percent cash back on all your purchases and a free 50 dollars for you and for me just follow the link in the show notes okay so if you notice that section on the book just confirmation is longer than any other section of the book mm. that indicates it's important this <laughs> confirmation yeah in, in uh, philosophy there's a branch of philosophy in epistemology called um um well a brilliant branch of philosophy called epistemology and this is the word is uh, defeasibility we put that in the end notes in case any listeners want to look into it more deeply but disconfirmation is a disconfirmation question is under what conditions could that belief be false notice i didn't say your belief which invokes a defensive posture under what conditions could that belief be false mm -hmm. and so um There are really four things people can say to you, and we'll bracket the fourth of I don't know. It's not relevant for the moment. The important things are three things. One, they tell you. Well, it could be, and we use the example of something with no moral valence, a beer truck. You're driving down the street. There's a beer truck in front of you. Your friend says, ah, beer truck is filled with beer. You say, how could that belief be wrong? Not how do you know that. See, the moment you say, how do you know that? which is a perfectly reasonable question. It's Socrates' question. They start telling you how they know that, and they talk themselves into the fact that there's a beer truck, that there's beer in the beer truck. You know, it says mm. beer on the side. There's a guy with a uniform. So to invoke scales from the book, you know, that would um, calibrate their belief confidence. They'd, re they'd calibrate it up once they heard their own reasons for belief. But if you ask them a disconfirmation question, it's an entryway, it's a gateway to doubt. So, mm. so, th so the first thing is they'll, they'll, say, they'll say something reasonable, like, well, it could have just dropped off. Ha, 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 under what conditions would you consider changing your mind that there's no beer in the beer truck? You say, well, if uh, I knew the beer truck had delivered its last case of beer and was going to re replenish it, or if I knew that the uh, beer truck How could the belief be false? Well, it could be false because they're on the way to the, the mechanics because there's some kind of problem with the brake fluid. Or, mm, I just made that right. something We like wouldn't that. know that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. They just tell you. The second thing is there are no conditions under which the belief could be false. So it's not disconfirmable. So this is the important thing for your listeners to note. If a belief isn't disconfirmable, so, so if there's no evidence you could provide someone with 
that would cause them to revise the belief, then that belief is informed on the basis of evidence. Because by definition, what it means to formulate a belief on the basis of evidence is that there could be some other evidence that comes in that causes someone to revise their belief. Right. So that's the second thing. The third thing is they offer you a wildly dis- disconfirmable belief criterion. Like aliens, aliens hijacked the beer truck. I think that's the one, that's the example we use in how to have impossible conversations. Right. So, well, how, how would you know that there are aliens in, in, you know, in the beer truck? Okay. So if you can demonstrate to me, my belief that there's beer in the beer truck could be false if aliens hijack the truck. So those are the three ways. And the fourth way is I don't know, which is we'll bracket that. But those are the three, three, three things. There are only basically so many things people can say to you when you ask them to disconfirm their own beliefs. Right. So, but I've, I've seen, uh, so we, we have a mutual friend, uh, Anthony Magnabosco, right? I've seen oh, a lot yes. of his- Wonderful um, human. Oh my God. Fantastic guy. Right. I mean, he's, he's like heroin to me. Amazing <laughs> human watching. being. Right. Right. Um, okay. So I've watched uh, probably a hundred uh, of his street epistemology videos. I, right. I find that a lot of people get confused when he goes into the disconfirmation stage. They're like, what, what, why are you asking me that? Or they meet it with skepticism or, or negativity. Maybe like, do you have any pointers to like how to, how to sort of segue into that in an organic manner? Um, it depends. So all of these conversations are so contextual because you don't know what people mm. are going to say to you. You don't know what, you don't even know what you're talking about. So, and you don't know the psychological disposition or the attitudinal disposition of the person, the psychological makeup, the cultural circles. You have no idea what it is. So I'm hesitant to say that there's a universal go-to of, you know, if, if they say to you, how, how do you go into a disconfirmation question? If you follow the book, the rules in the book sequentially, build rapport, you know, work on w- words, figure out epistemology. Once you've figured out epistemology, that's good. I often use a version of John W. Loftus's Outsider Test for Faith. That's been coming a lot, up a lot lately in my podcast. And I usually like, um, once I figure that out, and you mentioned Rappaport's rules, then I immediately go to scales. And once I ask them to put the belief on a scale, uh, right. Let, let's just spell that out. I know what you mean, but but the audience might not know. Scale is really just to to ask people to assign a number to their yeah. confidence level in the belief, whatever it is, right? Yeah. And and once they do that, once they assign a number, to how confident you are in the belief, you get a much better sense of how they could react. Like lo- people with the higher degrees of confidence might. It might invoke a defensive posture, whereas people with lower degrees of confidence, it usually will not. It almost never does anyway. Mm, right. So you can actually use it for, for a sort of a calibration on how to move along with disconfirmation is what I think you're saying. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that scales are an indispensable part of the book, but boy, are they, if I'm going to take a picture of another person in a rabbit suit. There must be... I'm going to take a picture of them and send <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. sure. Oh, and they're giving out wine to people. How crazy is that? That's two, two people in a rabbit suit in like, what, 10 minutes? Okay, so where were we? Let's keep going. We're, I, I was going to ask you about probing the limits. This might be a suitable time to do that. Yeah, so that's one of my – I love that section of the book. Chapter 6 is my favorite section of the book. So probing the limits. Um, there are 36 techniques in the book. 35 of those are evidence-based. Uh, this one is not. This is just from a mountain of uh, anecdotal experience that I've had, and I've made inferences from the literature, but I have no evidence. Unlike every single other technique in the book, I have absolutely no evidence that this works other than my mm. own my own experience. So it's it's um it's so take that take that for what it is. So basically, the idea is a friend of mine. This happened both to me and to him. Someone at the university where I teach said, if a white male told me two plus two equals four, I wouldn't believe him. So probe the limits is this idea that we figure out if people can live in accordance to what their beliefs actually are. And it has a multitude of very theoretical, and again, it's a weird, it's not like anything else in the book. And I've gotten a lot of comments on it. It's, it's super, I think it's a super interesting section in the book. Right. But give me a specific question about it. 
Uh, no, I, w- I, w- I was just how to um, like what what would be something like, like let's just take um, take a conversation an imagined conversation with uh, let's let's just use religion as an example right that often okay. comes up. So what yep. would be what would be something? So let's, let's say you have something on a hundred on the scale, right? right. And um, and you're asking your disconfirmation questions, and how would you go about like probing those limits? Okay, that's a good question. Hold on one second. Sure. All right. So that's a good question. So, so you, we, I wrote that section specifically for the social justice devotees. Right. That whole section in the in the book is dedicated to people who have bizarre beliefs about identity and identity politics, etc. Right. So let's see. A religion. Well, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Like, I guess if you were a biblical literalist, you'd ask them how they go about their day uh there's actually a guy who lived by every rule in the bible for a year and he wrote his experiences about that i can't remember his name but um (laughs) it it, you you could just so the book sets up every single section of the book has templates and those templates basically put forward an incredibly straightforward way and we recommend sticking to them as closely as possible to have 15, 25 conversations and then varying and experimenting and trying it yourself. You can personalize it at that point, but everything is built on the literature. So don't, don't mess with it. It works. It's that we know this. So if probing the limits is you ask somebody questions, like if I don't really know how much it works in the traditional Abrahamic faith, but it certainly works very well in my experience with the new faith of social justice. Right, so right, right. Let's, let's take a, so, a social justice warrior example. Uh, let, let's say I, I think everything, all social interactions at my college, but but in society in general, it's all because of the patriarchy. patriarchy. Right, right. And so the, the exa- I'm trying to walk around the neighborhood where I avoid lawnmowers. Everyone seems to be mowing the lawn. Uh, so <laughs> if, if, if you could... It, so, for example, I think the example we use in the book is, you know, I wouldn't, building off of the I wouldn't believe a white man if he told me two plus two equals four. Uh, so that's a really an astonishing statement. Now, that could be just verbal behavior, which I suspect that it is. It could be a type of virtue signaling to let them, t- to give a, a political orientation to let you know their identity. Uh, not their identity, but to let them, to let you know their political stance. So... Uh, probe the limits of the belief is like, oh, that's really interesting. What if you went to a hospital and you needed an emergency surgery and there was only one doctor there, a uh, straight white male, would you let him? Or do you, how, how frequently do you do this? Do you do this with when you flick on switches in the room? I mean, I know this sounds preposterous, but this is, but that's why this is an experimental technique. I know this, but it sounds utterly absurd, but this is the way, these people have utterly deranged views of reality, right? So anybody who would say that to you, you you need to just treat them. Their thinking is so damaged that they need to be treated a little differently. So how how do you, when you walk into a room and you flick on the lights and you want the light to go on, if the room is dark, do you, how do you figure out about the sex and sexual orientation and gender of the electrician? Or what if you fly in a plane? How do you go about figuring out, do you, do you trust white, straight white men to fly planes? Would you fly in a plane with a straight white male? Would you, would you take a loved one in an emergency room situation and there's only one doctor? How would you, how would you go about, would you ask the, the attending physician his sexual orientation before they operated on your loved one? Right. So it's, um, it's just, right. a, yeah, go ahead. No, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know. I know I'm supposed to say, no, you go ahead. Ah, you got from the book. So, so that's from the book too, right? That's no right. you go. So if we, if we speak at the same time, uh, instead of one person speaking over the other person, you say, no, no, you go. So right. if we speak and you say go and I say, no, you go. And you'll see like 99% of the time, like almost always, virtually always, people will go. Which is that's great. right. That's then right. Then they know you're listening. That's right. a modeling behavior as well. 
Right. It's excellent. Okay. okay. I, I, I think, Peter, honestly, at this point, we have to um, we have to sort of describe this academic crisis or this social justice warrior crisis. I know a lot of people listening to this will just be thinking, what on earth are these people talking about right now? But let's let's get into the symptoms Like I know you've experienced this on your own body. I know you've collaborated with um, Brett Weinstein and his wife. What's her name? Heather. Heather Hein. Heather Hein. Thank you. And I know a lot of other people. I, I mean, Jordan Peterson, sort of also part of this wave. But, but yeah. what is, in your opinion, if we like, if we really cut it to the bone, like, what's the real issue here? When when you say here. What 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 specifically do you mean? I think that's what I'm trying to ask ask you. When when you refer to this social justice crisis, what specifically mm -hmm. do you mean by that? Or, um, uh, okay, let me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is actually uh, no. Let me ask you a more. Let me just answer that question. What do I mean? Well, well, well there is clearly this. There is clearly a crisis. In academia, especially social science, humanistics, uh, art, liberal arts, where a lot of the research seems to be driven by preconceived biases, essentially, not data. Yeah. So the, the, these, okay, so here's, a, I'll read you, a, a, not a big fan of re, 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 uh, reading, but uh, a critical approach to the study of culture, cultural studies that looks for an and amplified social grievances in order to, quote, make oppression visible, unquote. Uh, grievance studies focuses on matters of identity, such as race, gender, sexuality, ability, status, etc. The name grievance studies fits because disciplines like gender studies, for example, use the critical method to study culture associated with identity in this way. So, the, the, so here's the problem in which we find ourselves. We find ourselves in which some, it, it's hard for me to, state this in a way that is not impolitic right nicely so we have a bunch of folks who have tenure who are in the academy who richard dawkins calls them pretentious charlatans who right. have it's not even that they've manufactured knowledge because it's not even knowledge is that they've put an agenda before their scholarship they've They are utterly preoccupied with oppression variables. They're making shit up. Is that really, again, it seems vulgar, but it's really the most polite thing you can say about these folks. Right. They're basically I making shit up. They've put an agenda before the truth. They've hoodwinked university administrators, the public, etc. It's It's leaking out of the academy. They've culled intellectual diversity. They are third-rate ideologues. Right. I heard your uh, friend and um, collaborator, James Lindsay, refer to it as idea laundering. I think that's, yeah, that's great. That's, that's such that's, a great term. Yeah, that's Brett's term. Here's what idea laundering oh, is. Oh, sorry. Let, let's say, and I, my, if people want to read more about this, I published a piece in the Wall Street Journal about it. So idea laundering is this idea that <laughs> he gave us that in his house one night <laughs> over many drinks. Um, <laughs> idea, idea laundering is the idea that Let's say that you have some moral impulse, and I have a moral impulse, and we may, maybe we don't really have a way to discharge our moral impulse, but we're both academicians. So we get together, and we uh, find another person. We don't even need another person. Let's just include another person. We find another person who also has a moral impulse, and we say, like, let's make a journal about this. So we make a peer-reviewed academic journal where we write stuff. We follow all the rules. Uh, You know, it has an editor, it has a submission process, it rejects or accepts, uh, desk rejects, uh, you know, they have a, a revise and resubmit process. It follows it, ex excuse me, externally, it looks identical. So it comes in as a moral impulse. They launder it in a journal and it comes out as knowledge. And then when they go to formulate or influence public policy, what they do is they point to The journal, and when yeah, you say the, this, the studies, how, quote unquote. Yeah. So, so for example, Christians have a very different mechanism. At the end of the day, almost always it will be based on faith or some weird kind of presuppositionalism. These people don't need any of that because they've manufactured 
entire domains of inquiry that are completely, completely untethered to reality. Right. To what degree do you think they, they do this on purpose? On purpose? Is, it, is it a concerted effort or is it, are they cognitively blinded by their ideology? Uh, their moral minds have overridden their rational minds. So they have this idea, for example, of bias being the worst thing imaginable. They have these ideas of, oh, you know, the, the, look, so even taking a step back from all this, the other thing is there's some truth in all of this stuff. There's like a kernel of truth in literally all of it, almost all of it. So there has been historical oppression. There has and continues to be oppression of trans people and certainly not, not so much gays anymore as there were 15, 20 years ago, but oppression against gays. And, you know, there's a whole Larry Elder thing. It's the, there's the prejudice against blacks systemic or not. We'll leave that aside. Certainly it's the case that there are some deranged individuals who harbor racist attitudes towards people. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't even have to be that. I was reading a piece that Andrew, uh, Andrew Yang, I support Andrew Yang for president, uh, just published about being Asian. So certainly that is the case. So the problem is that when an ideology has a kernel of truth to it, right, as opposed to Christians who are talking about angels and talking snakes and all that stuff, it, when an ideology has a kernel of truth to it, it builds upon that kernel of truth to make itself look more reasonable. And what has happened is these people have institutionalized policies based upon a, a worldview, an ideology that is clear, not just, look, I can't prove that Jesus didn't walk on water. I can't even prove that there was a historical Jesus, but I can certainly prove that the literature coming out of these departments is fucking bullshit. <laughs> I'm going to quote you for that, probably. Yeah, you quote me on that. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, it's really disturbing, honestly, especially when you look into it. I was looking at my uh, my old university, which is uh, University of Copenhagen's website last night. And, and sure enough, there was a new diversity division. And I looked into it and they had the bias uh, tests and all that stuff. Bi yep. Yep. Right. Um, I mean, I wrote I mean, a paper I mean, about that. Okay. Yeah, we, okay. Wrote a, we wrote a paper about that. You know, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, it, it, it's really interesting. But but I just saw, and, and of course those those tests are real tests. I mean, they measure something. Yeah. They may not always. I mean, I think they're they're used in a, in a systemic agenda here. But they actually manipulated numbers. You know, just statistics on the landing page of this weird organization originally from the uk now right. uh, going and into denmark and and probably other european countries as well i I'm, i mean i'm it, it's so yeah. so here's so to understand that you need to understand the worldview and the worldview is that their first principle is that racism exists sexism exists that's the kathy newman interview of jordan peterson to yeah. a certain extent. like the fundamental they they have a worldview based upon constituent quote unquote facts or things that they they believe to be true and then they construct a, not only a worldview out it's it's literally an epistemology as well and so they know that there's racism and sexism and bigotry and homophobia and transphobia etc 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 and then they want to make it visible they want to point it out they want to remediate that in any way possible so here's what will be interesting as we move forward in this crisis I predict, as I predicted all along, first and second tier universities will be fine. But when you mentioned that, you know, I don't know what university you're talking about. By the way, I had some of the best times of my life in, in Denmark. I love the Danish people. Right. Love that place. <laughs> uh, just amazing, amazing people. Culture, love it. Huge fan of you people. Anyway. Right. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. It really is true. I love it. Um, so... So as so first tier schools will be fine. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, everybody's going to want to send their kids there. Second tier schools, eh, pretty good, I think. Third tier schools are just screwed right now. How they're already uh, the salaries of administrators are crazy, and if you point that out, all of a sudden that makes you a conservative. So the yeah. fact that I point out that salaries of administrators have increased dramatically, and entire offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion were created whole cloth. And I point that out, that makes me a conservative. No. Yeah. So you'll see what will happen. Here's my prediction. 
I do not think the university system at third and fourth tier schools will survive. We've already seen the first slices of cuts. You can only run deficits for so long. It, it, so, so it's a, a long, right. it's, it's a big problem. But part of that is that there's been a rush to fill this diversity, equity, and inclusion market. And the consequence of attempting to fill that market is we've lost fundamental things about what a university is, what it can be. It has now become, not exclusively, but um, whole wings of university architecture are replicated to, uh, are, are devoted to replicating the dominant ideology. Right. right. Remediating injustice. And, right, uh, and that, that, that's where science can actually suffer, right? Because it not only does it mean that there are a, a whole array of, of areas that we can't do research in, like, like the whole, I'm actually speaking to James Flynn tomorrow. I mean, that oh, whole- Oh, Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, the Flynn effect. Right. The Flynn effect. Exactly. And but and that whole debate. I mean, he's he's even pointed out that there's you can't do research in. It's actually hard to do just research in intelligence. Yeah. On it's any level. You, right. You can't do that. Look what they did to Charles Murray, et cetera. Uh, they're doing people, it. They're doing it to James Flynn now as well. 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 They. Yeah. Because that's part of their worldview. Their worldview is that this is inherently racist and biased. So if you can't prove the test or racism bias or whatever, and there are, you know, look, this is a whole, uh, another conversation. And that is yeah. really the hottest, the hottest of hot potatoes is race and IQ. And if we start talking about that, you know, that's not, there's no point talking about that as I have no relevant expertise in that domain of inquiry. Right. I, but let's take another, let's take another look at, for example, uh, trans issues and people sure. who have trans transitions who want to, in this, you don't really need that much expertise to understand this example, whereas the other one you need a lot. It's called race realism. But so, so, so for this, um, there have been IRBs, institutional review boards, when people have wanted to study trans people who have regretted the fact that they transitioned. And they wouldn't approve those studies. Mm. They wouldn't approve those studies because they think that they're transphobic. Uh, Kate, Katie Herzog, who I don't know if she still works at The Stranger or worked at The Stranger, uh, said something utterly fascinating. When, actually, when I was at Brett and Heather's event, he was on stage with them. And she said that she's a lesbian, a female, born female woman mm. who lives in Seattle, Washington. And she said that every femme lesbian she knows cannot find a butch partner because they've all transitioned to men and i see this i found that to be fascinating i see this in my douglas murray in the madness of crowds calls this a clustering effect but the fact is that we've put the reins on certain types of scientific investigation to mm -hmm. investigate pre-existing phenomenon you know there was a study about whether or not what, how baby? I can't remember the exact study, but how how babies respond when you prick their feet with a needle, but they weren't <laughs> pricking babies' feet with a needle. Babies were, were already getting their feet pricked with a needle, and they just recorded their responses. That's mm. totally reasonable. Sure. Like that's now now you, you you could make another argument if you say, well, we just want to start stabbing babies with with needles. Okay, so, so, so that's in the intentional infliction of pain. We're talking about people who have transitioned and then want to, uh, and, and then regret that. And so you can't even get approval for those. So, it's wow. like, so, so there is an ideological bias fueled right. by the lunatics in almost anything with the, with the word studies in it, almost anything. Well, These I mean, people okay. are, right, yeah, go please. ahead. No, no, please no, go no, ahead. Go. <laughs> this is a, uh, this is a tough one, Peter. I, I mean, I listen to the guru, what he asked me to do, or no, no, this no, is a trap go, go, I'm going into. Okay, okay, no, I have, I have two. I, I was going to, I want to ask you something else uh, about something you said a minute ago, but I want to share this with you. So I have a friend, um, she, she, she's an elementary school teacher here in California, yeah. and yeah. she told me, we, we went out for, for dinner about a year ago, but yeah. among her like 10, 11, 12-year-old students, I think the number she mentions 
mentioned was something like 20, 30% of them now don't identify with a gender anymore. Yeah, so, so and that clearly, started from in a few right. years, right? And I asked right, her, so are you worried about this? And she said, it's a trend, right? That's how she, I mean. Yeah. So. But this ties so can, in with what we're talking about, doesn't it? It does. And we could explain that in the work of Lyle Asher. Explains that very well. I would recommend looking at it. starts in colleges of education. It also starts with the value that you need to, like what I said in chapter six of how to have impossible conversations. The uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the section, but what's the name of the section? Uh, oh, uh, live to what you believe. Or anyway, right. anyway. So 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 in that section, it, it all speaks to you. All this is like a recipe. You cull diverse voices. You label and smear everybody as a racist bigot homophobe you and, and lindsay has something that he's just put out that i think is absolutely spot on many of the grievance studies folks don't want their they're having a big problem with putting their classes online right so a lot of the universities have been shut down and people are using zoom and other modalities online modalities and they're freaking out about this because they know that somebody is gonna capture this and put it out and people are going to see that these people are fucking lunatics they're going to see what they actually teach it's totally divorced from reality all right, all right. it's just it's it's demonstrably false right I, I mean some and even some of the stuff that's not false it's it's it's, it's like watching some of the stuff from evergreen uh, i mean <laughs> it's like theater almost yeah watching. so evergreen <laughs> Evergreen is the pinnacle. That's what happens when social justice ideology takes over an institution. Now, I would urge your listeners or your viewers to watch Benjamin Boyce's YouTube videos. That's what happens when intersectionality, social justice, and the cheerleaders, the champions of equity, which is another deranged concept, take over governmental structures. Right. Benjamin Boyce on YouTube. And this is happening. This is this is happening in the U.S. Obviously, but it's certainly also happening in Europe. I mean, I mean, I don't know what other right. continents is. I mean, I, Australia. What, I one, one more recommendation. I highly recommend viewers and listeners listen to and watch Mike and Nana's video. You've mentioned Brett and Heather and Evergreen a few times. He has a wonderful Netflix quality documentary on what's happening right now. Uh, or, or how that unfolded and the manifestations of that. So we're, this is not some weird abstract thing I'm talking about. This is not a few nut jobs, a few crackpots. No. This is an ideology which is wholesale taken over. Now, I'll, I'll give you, I wrote a, I published a piece on this for the, the Philosopher's Magazine. It's called Deluded Departments that people can check out. Hmm. All right. I, I want to, okay, I want to get your thoughts on this. So I heard, you know, Jordan Peterson has, has often criticized liberal arts. I mean, he not exactly in the same manner as we've been doing today. But I heard one, I don't remember where, where this was, but he suggested that maybe we should just let the free market deal with this. So here's my, my initial thoughts on this. I, know, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to unbias you, actually. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I don't know that there's an alternative once, if, if I'm correct, and I will see soon enough, my prediction is not five or 10 years, it's in one or two. Uh, if, if, these, if these third or fourth tier schools start falling, and we've already seen some of the for-profit schools, big, big for-profit schools fall, if these schools fall, what's going to replace them? I think that there's sufficient erosion of trust in our institutions, the philosopher Jürgen Habermas calls it a legitimation crisis. There is a, a crisis of legitimacy in our institutions, and there's a very, very good reason for that. Beside the lunatic in the White House, and I will not name this lunatic, and his insane, and his fellow henchmen lunatics in office, we have lunatics in the academy. So the, the confidence in our public institutions is undermined from multiple by multiple threats, multiple competing ideologies and overlapping ideologies. And right, right. now we're looking at grievance studies departments having almost single-handedly undermined the legitimacy of the institutions, not necessarily because of their scholarship, although that was certainly contributory, but because of the fact that they managed to institutionalize their deranged worldview. Right. Yeah. 
and uh, launder it too. Yes. Right. They've laundered. Uh, so when, when, you, when you ask them, well, how do you know? How do we know we should institutionalize this? Well, they point to an article by someone who's, who's totally deranged. Right. You, the, you shouldn't give this. The, this is not legitimate knowledge. It has not undergone. And not that everything that has undergone the scientific process is necessarily legitimate. You know, you have, I think I mentioned string theory. Or like you can, it, it, it's, or you can, you know, poetic dance or any of that stuff. But poetic dance does not claim to be knowledge. Right. Even string theory says if the universe is, you know, this is a possible explanatory model right. for the universe, and we know that by its predictive capacity. Right. Now, what that is, I have no idea. I'm not a particle physicist, but they're, they're playing by the rules of science. Sure. These sure. people are pretending. They are pretending to know things they do not know. And that's why you call it a religion. Yes. Would that be correct? Right. Okay. okay but okay. But I, I just want to. I, I just have to share this with you because I remember during my graduate studies. Um, so I have two master's degrees. But the, the first one, I, I started. I was uh, long story short. I just noticed some fun stuff starting to happen at University of Copenhagen, and one of those things right. was it started being run as a business, and that meant that I believe every quarter all the students would have the teacher go out and they would rate the teacher and, and uh, criticizing right. them w was encouraged. And I remember there was this poor teacher. She was really professional and good, like very scientific minded. And, and, she, and someone asked her, can you just email us the, the slides from the presentations? And she, told, she answered right. it, no, I'm not doing that. And there's actually a reason I don't do that. There's uh, some research showing that that's not helpful. It's detrimental to learning, right. blah, blah, blah. And they kept complaining about it. Eventually, they had her almost like bullied into doing it. And her job security threatened. But it was this constant. It was actually, in a sense, the free, the free market. It, it, it had been pulled out of a context where the university was, was just sponsored. The state would just give it a bunch of money, a bag of money each year. But now, now it's being run like a business. And, and right. um, from my vantage point, it looks as if it was the very fact that that happened, that it that right. started going south. Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question. And I, in my ideal world, if I waved a wand, institutions would be able to police themselves. I mean, look, look what they did mm. to me to whistleblowing on grieving studies. They lost their minds. So they lost their mind. So, so they're incapable of their judgments just cannot be, be trusted because they're explicitly activists in their orientation. So the question is then how do we engage or how, what's the corrective mechanism? So, so, so how do we do that? Well, there is no way to do that. There is no way to do that because they don't want you to, it's called penetration testing and, you know, and, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to sneak a, a bomb through an airport, that you know, uh, whatever those detectors are called. Right. You, you know, and if you do that successfully and you tell people about it, I can almost guarantee you that, that they would thank you. Would some people lose face? Yeah, but that's, they should be able to defend. They should have to defend how, how it is that the system wasn't fixed so we can, we can get to those issues, right? Right. But these, right. Folks, have, these folks have an agenda. And there's absolutely nothing. Their beliefs are not defeasible. They're not revisable. So, you know, right. we will reap. We will reap. Look, it, it, I'm trying not to talk about the plague. We, we, we will reap what we sow. So the university, university administrators should not be surprised at the coming economic crisis. Uh, not economic crisis broadly, but the current crisis, uh, financial crisis to universities. Please, right. uh, please don't be surprised. You caused this. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so uh, I mean, this really pains me, but I want to follow my structure, which means I'm going to have to ask you the bonus question. We're, 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 it was yeah. just getting interesting. Where I felt like we were getting somewhere, uh, somewhere deep, even. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still. I, I'm, I'm still so. What's the way out of this? Or I'm, I mean. Yeah, so let's run with this since you're, you're enjoying it. So, so, the, okay. so the way out of this, so look, these, this ideology is too, um, it's too 
invasive. It's it's parasitized too many modes and mod and, and ways of thinking about problems. It's too totalizing. Um, so th there is no possibility of any self-corrective mechanism whatsoever. It, it cannot correct for itself. It is simply not possible. So then the question becomes, well, what happens? Well, either Peterson's idea that there's kind of that, that we reintroduce market forces in this or alternative teaching or, uh, or, or learning right, ways but that if, But if learn, demand like points in the, I'm sorry. Go. No, oh, no, okay, I was just saying, but yeah, but that's the thing. With a free market, there might be an increased demand for more of this, for more evergreen colleges, right? Which, which would only reinforce the mechanism and make no, it. No, that's, that's, that's just not true because if you look at Evergreen, even years after this, enrollment plummeted. Right. You should, you should look at the video that, we, that I put out. I, I saw the whole thing. I saw the whole thing. About, yeah, so so yeah, right. th that's just one slip. And that was in the middle of a pandemic and people were coming out. Not in the middle, but early stages. People mm. are sick and tired of this. Right. What do they want in their education? They want to learn. They want to challenge in humanities education. They want to challenge what they believe. They want to learn from experts. And, you know, I've been told, for example, okay. I can't render, render my opinion in, cl in class or render my opinion it, or teach in such a way that it renders my opinion obvious. Well, I, 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 yeah. I happen to disagree with that. I asked for that in writing. I never got that in writing. So what's the way out of this? The first order of business is we have to ask, we have to start valuing the right things. We are simply not valuing the right things. We're not valuing evidence. We're not val valuing reason. What I heard you say was, and ultimately, we're not valuing truth enough. Yes, we're not valuing the things that are true. We're privileging ideology and agenda over knowledge. We have individuals who have no business. They don't even deserve to be, I was going to say whatever I say, then I get 500, I almost said dog catchers, but then I get 500 dog catchers emailing me saying, what's bad, so bad about dog catching? But so, so whatever it is in the society that is, I don't even want to say what it is. They simply have no place in the university. Right. So, so, so what's your, your question is, what is the way ahead? First, we have to be honest. Second, we have to tr shoot for cultural organizational changes. We have to delegitimize these, these fields. But the, here's the problem. The problem is, and someone will watch, someone will cut what I just said and put it out of context to delegitimize the field. The fields have delegitimized this to themselves. The problem is that we absolutely have to study vital issues of race, gender, and sexuality, but we have to do it right. It cannot be agenda-driven. Right. This is right. agenda-driven sco scholarship, pure and simple. Okay. And, okay. And you're in the process, and I hope we can contribute to this, of exposing these tendencies as well. So I feel a little better now, Peter. Are you up for some super quick bonus questions? All right, go for it. Then I'm going okay. to make, make dinner for my family. I got you, go got you. But just, yeah. Okay. What's the thing that you used to believe that you no longer believe? I changed my beliefs very recently about gun ownership. I am now a, an assault rifle owner, a big, big gun owner. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. If you could allocate a trillion dollars to research, which specific area would it go to? A, a, a trillion? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, that's it. I'd have to think about it. First thing off the top of my head, something with something environmental. Don't know what it would be. Uh, uh, anthropogenic climate change, uh, ways to change, you know, technological solutions to that, helping people value that maybe plastic in the oceans, but something ecological, don't know what. Okay, got you, got you. So not and, moral and if philosophy. I, if, no, if I can, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> if, I could, if I could distribute that trillion in a bunch of ways, I would say wealth equality is an enormous problem. And that's one of the reasons that you know, I was supporting universal basic income and many of the people on the right are call, were calling me a, a communist. And now their own man, Trump, uh, uh, I guess if you could call him a Republican, Trump and the Republicans are putting forth a UBI plan. So go it's figure. It's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, really so, interesting uh, development. Wealth yeah. disparity, opioid use would be somewhere on the list. Homelessness would be first. That I think that's what I'm going to do in the twilight of my career if I'm still if I haven't dropped dead yet. All right, next awesome, question. Awesome. Okay, free will, illusion, or real? Illusion. Next. Okay, have you ever had an experience that you experienced at the time as supernatural? Uh, 
about supernatural, not what I would consider supernatural. No. Next. Okay. What's the life changing book you've read? Uh, Plato's Apology. Awesome. Okay. The legacy question What is the single question that you would like more than anything to have the answer to? It's interesting because embedded in that question is the answer itself. So it assumes that there's an objective answer to the question I asked, which even, even I guess, I guess the question would be, how would I know that? Like, how mm. would I know that the answer was accurate? So is that the answer to the question? No, it's, it's a, I guess it's just, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe that's the question. It, it's, fu that? it's funny. It's funny you point that out because I, I, I did a, another version of this question. I changed it a little bit I, I, where I would say, assume an omnipotent being was able to answer. Oh, but everybody okay. would get that wrong. Say, oh, so you're saying there's a God. Assuming there is a God. Right. But that's not what I'm trying to say here. So so that's that's interesting. So I guess that is my, my answer. How, how would I know the answer would absolutely correct? And that response. But then I would have to. Anyway, I'll leave it there because, because the problem would be like, you know, how, how would I really know? Like say, well, there's an, there's an objective council of elders on the rock. Hold on. Ho sure. Hold on one second. Let's, let's linger on this if you don't mind. So, sure. so the, the, the reason if you think about an omnipotent being an, uh, or, or let's say a being that knows everything and everything, has knowledge of everything, the only way you could know if that being was omnipotent, you can't reason to that. You would have to be omnipotent. And then you would have to be able to communicate with that being to see if it knows something you don't know, or you know something it doesn't know, then by definition, it wouldn't be all knowledgeable. So that's right. a way to think about the assumptions that are baked into that question. All right. What's the final uh, question? Right, right. I did another version with AI, but okay. Let's, so the final question is the question that Matt Hudson, the latest guest on the podcast asked when I asked him the legacy question, and he just yeah. wants to know, how should one decide what to do with one's life? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. I'll, I'll throw out some possible, how about I throw out, instead of telling anybody, because I don't think it's a question that lends itself to an easy answer, I'm happy to, to offer heuristics or help ways sure. I hope people will find helpful to answer the question. One way is you, you have to, in order to answer the question, you have to have enough information and know that you've arrived, that the path you're taking is a good one. And in order to, to do that, you have to have, I hate to be geeky about it, but an epistemology, like you have to have a way to come to conclusions and a way to reason that will help you come to conclusions that are less likely to be false. So the answer to that question is epistemology. Focus on how do you know what you know? Is your belief disconfirmable? Under what conditions is it disconfirmable? The mo and the moment you do that, you can start branching out into things like the added attitudes, like is my belief revisible? How do I know what to live my life? Well, you maybe I should go to college or grad school or go to the military or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a structure to situate the question, like an infrastructure in which you can evaluate the accuracy- Value. Isn't that what yeah. you're saying? Essentially, evaluate value. Yeah, it, it it's a way. I don't want to get meta about it, but it's a way to maybe hierarchically prioritize values or moral triage or figure out if you can how dependable your conclusions can be. But if you don't have that infrastructure in place and you pursue a form of life, you could be working against your best interest and the best interests of your community. So my answer with that question would be to really focus on cleaning up your thinking to focus on valuing the right things, to focus on becoming a good reasoner. And I, the American Philosophical Association's Delphi Report, there's a little section in it, called, you can get that online, called The Ideal Critical Thinker. Just look through that. Look through some of that, the, the, the constructs that they give and some of the, it, it's really interesting, some of the writings, it's really interesting. So my answer to the question would be, focus on epistemology and then whatever answer you choose it's more it's less likely to be wrong 
So you can rely upon that if you have a good epistemology. Very awesome. I'll pass it on. And I want to say this was beyond my expectations and my expectations were extremely high. So thank you very much, oh, Peter. Wonderful. Thanks, man. I appreciate your time. I'm going to go cook for my family. You have an awesome night. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye. Right on, bro. Later. I'll be in touch. Cheers. Stay tuned for more mind-blowing conversations here on MetaQuest. Next time I talk to James Flynn, that's right, the person who discovered the Flynn effect, the fact that we're all getting smarter over time. Stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening, and have a good one. Cheers.